Well, welcome everyone. I appreciate everybody coming here for this oral history. And before we start, I'm going to give a little bit of background information on Rachel Levine's accomplishments. Okay. Rachel is currently, Dr. Levine is currently Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and Professor of Pediatrics and Psychiatry at the Penn State College of Medicine. She's also a Fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Society for Adolescent Medicine, and the Academy of Eating Disorders. And she's also a board member of ASTHO, or the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. So Dr. Levine joined the Wolf Administration, for those of you, who, that's the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, the Wolf Administration in January 2015 as the Physician General of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and served in that role from 2015 to 2017. Then she was named Acting Direct Secretary of Health in July of 2017 and confirmed as the Secretary of Health in March of 2018. Her previous posts have included Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs for the Department of Pediatrics and Chief of the Division of Adolescent Medicine and Eating Disorders at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center, where I have the pleasure of, of serving as well. In addition to her recent posts, Dr. Levine is also an accomplished regional and international speaker and author on the opioid crisis, medical marijuana, adolescent medicine, eating disorders, and LGBT medicine. Dr. Levine graduated from Harvard College and the Tulane University School of Medicine. She completed her training in pediatrics and adolescent medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. So we will start with some, some questions. Some questions. And I've had the chance. I've had the chance to. I've had the chance to work with Rachel in a number of um, different venues. But I also had the chance to speak with her earlier to just get a sense of where where she's come in her life journey. And we'll start with that. So this let's. Is, uh, so thank you. I just want to interrupt you for a second. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me, um, and uh, thank you for interviewing me. Uh, this really feels like a like a therapy session, except there's an audience. So I, mean, I get to talk about myself for an hour. I mean, what could be better than that? So well, actually, uh, the she clock talked, is ticking, maybe she, 50 minutes, actually. She talked to herself for longer than an I, hour. I can, I can. So go ahead so, and ask me the questions, and so, I'll just go. So, so I think the challenge will be to try to keep her Keep this into this shut, in, into, shut me up. into a sixty minute. People okay. have been trying to shut me up, including the Republican <laughs> Senate, but it's unsuc un unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully. Excellent. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. So we talked a little bit about how your family shaped your decision to go into medicine and your subsequent career path. So could you tell us a little well, bit about so that? I grew up in the greater Boston area, um, which is why I'm a Patriots and Red Sox fan. Sorry about that. And um, my whole family are attorneys. So um, I am the black sheep of the family, actually for a number of reasons now. And, but my mother, my father, my uncle, my sister, my cousin, my niece, and soon to be my son are attorneys. And so um, I didn't want to, I, didn't, I missed that gene, although I, I, I liked um, studying you know, that type of issue. Obviously, I've come around to government and law and things like that. Um, but I, I rapidly realized when I was a teenager that I didn't really want to become a lawyer. And so I was talking to my mother, and she said, you know, honey, you can do whatever you want. Whatever you want. You could go to law school, business school, or medical school. Whatever. <laughs> whatever you want to do. And so I said, well, I don't want to really go to law school, and I don't want to go to business school, so maybe I'll go to medical school. <laughs> and so um, th that actually it didn't make the final decision, but it, it uh, allowed me to um, kind of investigate an interest in biology. And I worked at a laboratory at Boston University Medical Center for, for many years and summers. And uh, that's when I went and majored in biology and then pre-med at, at Harvard. So why, how did you decide to go into pediatrics and, and subsequently adolescent medicine? Sure. So the, the, the research lab that I worked at at Boston University was a surgical research lab. And so um, I often will joke that, that uh, there's a reason I'm not a neurosurgeon, because I'm a klutz and I can't see. Um, it's not completely true. I still can't see. But, but um, I have better fine motor coordination than, than I allege. But, it, um, but we did a lot of you know, um, surgical research on animals and other various things. Um, so when I started medical school, I was going to be a surgeon. 
that's what I was going to do. And uh, really, about the second day of anatomy, when the real surgeons, uh, you could see, because they had their elbows up at the anatomy table, and they were just kind of pushing, and this, they wanted to dive right in. And I took a step back and said, I don't think I'm going to be a surgeon. So literally, about two days into medical school, it was very clear I wasn't going to be a surgeon. And so I was pretty open. Um, and then in the second year, we started um, to have clinical diagnosis courses, and one of them was in pediatrics. And um, it was one of the uh, pediatric residents interviewing a, a, a patient. We got to walk around with the, the pediatric unit. And I was like, this is, this is what I want to do, is pediatrics. And that was confirmed in my, in my third year. And then in my third and fourth year, in our pediatric course and then in clerkships, there was a, um, a faculty member. Um, many, some of you might, have, might remember him, Dr. Hyman Thomas uh, from New Orleans. Um, and he was um, voluntary faculty at Tulane and in private practice, but he would come and give lectures and you could visit him in his office, and he was part of this brand new field of adolescent medicine in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, and I was like, that's great. That's what I want to do, and that's what I did. So what was it about adolescent medicine that just um, that, that I, I, appealed I, to you? I, I really enjoyed um, and felt very rewarding talking to teenagers and their parents um, and dealing with their challenges. And I just thought that that, was, that, uh, that, uh, that aspect of pediatrics would fit really well with my, my interest and my skill set. Um, I've always had this long-term interest um, in where the, the intersection where medical issues intersect with psychological and behavioral health issues, and thus adolescent medicine. And so that's also sort of how I got into the eating disorder field, that, that perfect intersection. So that's how I started to develop the interest in adolescent medicine. And I went to Mount Sinai uh, because they had um, a great pediatric program. There's some other reasons. I was kind of um, one of the people at Sinai knew Dr. Hershorn, who was the uh, chair at Sinai at that time. Um, but also Les Jaffe was there. He was running the adolescent medicine program and they had um, both of what I wanted. So that's why I went to Sinai. So how did you end up at Penn State Hershey? And what was it like when you first yeah. got there? And so I, you know, I, 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 Mount Sinai was amazing. I knew I was in trouble when Dr. Hershorn said, um, when we were interns sitting in an auditorium, you know, the internship is the best year of your life. <laughs> that's, that's, that's sad. That's just sad. And he said, you know, when he was a resident, in the days of the Giants, when Dr. Hershorn was a resident, he, you know, he was on every other night. And you know the trouble with every other night? You missed half of those good cases. And I was like, oh boy, are we in trouble. So, um, but he, he was, he, uh, he's, he's still there. Uh, uh, he's still um, uh, doing research and teaching at, at Mount Sinai. I saw him a couple of years or so ago. And um, so Mount Sinai was an amazing experience. Um, and I was chief resident at Mount Sinai. And in those days, in, in 1980, um, let me think, 86, 87, um, the chief resident had so much power and so much authority. I mean, I ran that children's hospital. In fact, finally, many years later, as Secretary of Health, I think I finally had as much authority as I had as Chief President at Mount Sinai. It took a long time, but people finally listen again to what I say, and they do it. It's just amazing. So that, and, uh, but at, at, at Mount Sinai, at, at that time, I remember uh, the next, uh, I, that we had a fire in the Children's Hospital. And the entire children's hospital was filled with smoke. We had to evacuate the children's hospital, except for a couple of kids on ventilators in the PICU, uh, where some, some a couple of people, uh, a residents, a couple of nurses stayed. And we, I sent a part of, about a third of the children's hospital home um, because they were all asthma patients, and the hospital was filled with smoke. So we finally got the smoke filled. We brought everybody back in, and I walk into morning report, and I, see, you know, to Dr. Hershorn and Alex Hyatt, who was the vice chair, and said, so I evacuated the children's hospital last night, and then I sent about a third of the patients home but we're good. And it was like, okay. I mean, can you imagine that now? <laughs> when you had to evacuate the hospital and you sent like 30 or 40 patients home. Um, so it was an amazing experience. And so after my, my training and after my fellowship, I actually stayed in New York. And I, was, I did a couple of different things. I was in a, a private practice, uh, Dr. Edward Davies, um, in a, a private practice. And then I was also faculty at Sinai and uh, would see patients in the clinic like one half day a week and, and make rounds one or two um, months a year. And uh, did that for five more years. Um, and uh, then about in the 1990s, um, started to get a little bit tired in New York City. Um, it was busy, it was um, 
after okay. 10 years, I thought that was enough. And so started to look at other places. And then I went, uh, we, I found a position at Penn State College of Medicine in 1993. And in 1993, I escaped from New York, just like the movie, exactly like the movie. I escaped from New York uh, and went to Hershey, Pennsylvania. Who, who'd have thunk it, you know? So what was it like when you got there? I mean, I don't think they had an adolescent medicine division. And so they didn't. Like? So when I went to, uh, to, to Penn State in 1993, I was faculty at the College of Medicine, but I was based in a community hospital called Poly Clinic, uh, which is a hospital in Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. And so it was a joint program for pediatrics. And so the residents, all the residents rotated through Poly Clinic for their community pediatrics rotations, for their that being on that unit. So unlike, um, Unlike uh, the academic hospital where, you know, many of the patients had, you know, cancer and unusual other conditions, etc. Uh, this was bread and butter admissions. This was asthma and diarrhea and, and uh, infections and babies with sepsis and things like that. And so I was director of the outpatient clinics. I started adolescent medicine and all the residents came through our, our program. Uh, then in uh, 95, 96, that hospital was being taken over by another hospital and the relationship with Penn State College of Medicine was going to break up and so I went to the main campus in 1996 to run the pediatric clinics and start a brand new adolescent medicine program. So, so what was it like? What kind of challenges did you face? In well, it was great being at the, the um, at the Mecca, at the Academic Medical Center um, now, and, and running the pediatric clinics was great. And uh, it was um, my f further expansion of, of um, administration and, and leadership, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and it started adolescent medicine uh, with a lot of mentors, many of whom are in this room, uh, and started an eating disorder program. And I knew that I, what I wanted to do was to start a multidisciplinary eating disorder program uh, patterned after LIJ's program. And so I went to the, to the administration and said, I, well, we, we need psychiatrists, we need psychologists, we need nutritionists. And that type of interdisciplinary work was not done. So this was brand new, uh, but, but they, they went along with it. And so we started um, uh, very soon after I started, uh, one half day a week, seeing um, adolescent eating, patients with eating disorders. And then that grew um, over years until what, what it is now. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience uh, to, to start it fresh and to break down silos. So really, a lot of my career administratively and in terms of leadership has been collaboration and breaking down silos. And it started with building that clinic at, the, at Penn State Hershey. Were there particular challenges you experienced in trying to develop that um, that three, new type of three million challenges, and so uh, one of the challenges was billing. So I had this amazing idea, which we still have not accomplished in medicine, of doing bundle billing. Is I saw, gee, if we if you're going to come to the eating disorder clinic, you're going to see all of us, and so we will then send a bill to the insurance company and, and the people in budget, and, and just just laughed and laughed and said, you don't realize that's that's three different insurance companies, um, that, that because of the mental health carve out that we have in Pennsylvania and in much of the of the, of the country, and so uh, we had to work out how to bill for psychologists and psychiatrists and nutritionists out of the Department of Pediatrics. So that was all new. Um, and uh, then we were going to um, have a whole clinic um, outside of it. It was going to come out of the, the building and, and go into the community. And uh, some of it was going to be part of PEDS and some of it was going to be a part of psychiatry until the chair of psychiatry called me and said, well, you know, um, we really can't do this, so it's up to you. So we left the building, we found our, the current kind of space that we're in. And, um, and when we did that, we started um, a partial program. Uh, a partial hospitalization program, at first for um, older adolescents and young adults. Uh, then as things grew, we, um, were, they were building a new children's hospital and we were, we were doing lots of admissions at that point for children with, with kids with anorexia that was still in the, the place where we used to admit everybody. And so they, the new children's hospital was being built and they said and the, the seventh floor was going to be the adolescent eating disorder unit until I got a phone call from the chair saying, you know, we, we've actually run out of money. So uh, it's going to be five floors. So that seventh floor that you're on, that doesn't exist. So that's when we started for, for kids, uh, the idea that we would develop a um, child partial hospitalization program. So we'd have two parallel IOPs and two uh, intensive outpatient programs and two parallel 
partial hospitalization programs. Uh, and we worked for several years to start that program. And then this, this, this new recruit that I had um, from, from LIJ, um, and what was her name? Roland Ornstein uh, came in and said, you know, I'd like to run that program. The second day she was there, and, and in her own quiet, unassuming way. Um, and I said, um, sure, you run that program. And so things, things developed from there. I also, uh, a, year, a couple years before, had recruited Jody Brady Olympia from, mm -hmm. from LIJ. Um, so, no one's here from LIJ, but sorry about that. Oh, sorry about that, yeah. yeah. Yes, I know you were there at that time, so sorry. Um, and uh, we built the division and uh, built the eating disorder program. So, so now you're in a political position, the state government since 2015. Yeah. Um, so how did you come to be considered, how did you come to move from sure. being considered just doing primarily eating disorders to being considered right. in this state role? So I, you know, was like all, like all of you, I was firmly ensconced in academic medicine. So I, um, I was uh, division chief, um, I had been named as vice chair of clinical services and was fulfilling all my missions. And I had also done some advocacy work uh, for LGBTQ community. Um, and I was on the board of an organization called Equality Pennsylvania, which is a statewide advocacy group. And also on the board was someone that um, had been very instrumental in Governor Wolf's campaign. And so she called me up in December of 2014 and said she would like me to be the, the chair of the Transitions Committee for Health. So every, uh, every department has a transition committee when a new administration comes, so whether it's education or transportation. And I asked, you know, I, I figured, why would they want me to be head of the Transitions Committee? And then I realized they probably know I, I specialize in transitions. <laughs> So you got to think about that one for a second. So, um, so, I, um, uh, so I, I agreed to do that, and I met the outgoing secretary and the outgoing physician general, and uh, with their team, we wrote a report of the, um, uh, for, the, for the new administration. And I made it very clear that I would do this, but I wasn't giving up my day job, and that was fine. And at the end of it, you know, we started to have a discussion, would be a, there be a role for me in the administration? Now, we handed in our report like January 3rd, and the inauguration was January 11th. And so in the course of a week, I spoke with her, I spoke with the chief of staff, I met with the, the head of the, the whole governmental transition, I met with Governor Wolf. And so um, the, on the Friday before the, Thursday before the inauguration, which was on a Tuesday, I got a phone call saying, Governor Wolf, Governor Wolf will call you on Friday. So I got a phone call on Friday, and Governor Wolf said, we'd like you to be the physician general for Pennsylvania. And I went, thank you, Governor Wolf, absolutely. And hung up and went, whoa, <laughs> what did I just agree to? I mean, I really had a couple days, I thought it was coming, to decide. And uh, I just felt that this was something I should be doing. So I don't know how you think of the world. So whether it's God's will or your karma or the flow of the universe, I felt that this was an opportunity that, um, that would never come again. It was unique. Uh, that I could, I could maybe make a difference from a different perspective. Uh, for the LGBT community, this would be, this would be landmark, and I just jumped. Uh, my family thought I was completely crazy. And I think, um, my, I mean, I, you know, basically, I, Roland came in and said, you're leaving, aren't you? And I went, yes, I am. Welcome to being <laughs> acting division chief. Um, and I had, a, I had developed, a, a, seeing a lot of trans patients. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I, my patients had various ages, which I know has been a real headache for you. So I, um, um, for me, especially given the niches of, uh, in central Pennsylvania of eating disorders and transgender medicine, adolescent medicine was anybody younger than me. And, you know, I kept getting older and the patients kept going, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 52, um, uh, 58, because, 58 <laughs> because there were no, there was no one to see transgender patients between mm -hmm. Philly and Pittsburgh. And so I, I was not anybody's primary care provider at that time. So I'd work with their internists and we'd figure out if, if we could do this and we should do this. So uh, I, I know Cheryl greatly appreciated that when she took over the adolescent medicine division and we had all these patients in their 40s and a couple, only a couple in their 50s. Um, <laughs> Only a couple. Um, so, uh, I, uh, so one of the, um, the the family medicine physicians was going to start to do transgender medicine, and I said, "You, you now have like 200 patients. Have a, thank you so much. Have a really nice day." Um, so I jumped, and uh, I, I uh, it was announced on Saturday. 
uh, which made kind of a stir in the press, a little bit more than I expected. Um, and then, because as I'm, as I'm trans, and so uh, then um, I came in on Monday, I saw patients till six o'clock, on Tuesday was the inauguration, and on Wednesday I walked into the Pennsylvania Department of Health being the physician general, which, you know. But I did do something which was um, very prescient, and I don't really know exactly why I did it, but I, I said when they called up um, and offered me the job, I said, you know, I'll do this, I want to do this. But I'm giving up my, I mean, essentially giving up my academic medicine career, my academic career. So um, I want a seat at the table. I want to be a member of the cabinet. And they went, sure. But none of the previous physician generals had been a member of the cabinet. Physician general is kind of like the surgeon general. Surgeon general is not a member of the president's cabinet. And so, um, and so that made all the difference in this entire experience, was being a member of the cabinet, having a seat at the table. But I just felt if I was giving up so much that I should ask for that. And they said, sure. Um, so that, that was, I don't know how I thought to do, to do that, but I did, and so that made a tremendous difference. Um, I was able to keep my academic appointment, which was also key, um, and I do go back and teach on a, on a regular basis, but, I, but I, the other thing I had to do is I had to give up my practice. So not only the administration of the clinic, I had to give up all my patients. And that was a really hard decision, um, but that was the deal. So you either did that or you didn't do it, and so I did. And so, um, you know, I, I really felt the loss of clinical medicine, um, uh, especially at the beginning, but, uh, which I'd always done, but it, uh, it, gave, it opened up a whole new world, so, yeah. So, as phys physician general, what, what were your duties? Sure. What did you do so that? So, no that one knew what, 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 what this job would be, and it had no particular big job description, and so I really had a clean slate uh, to, to make it. And it was a challenge with the current, uh, with the secretary at that time, you know, because it's having two cabinet members in the same department. But um, I'm all about collaboration, and, and we made that, and she did, a, she was wonderful, and we kind of made that work. Um, so I, I did a lot of, um, of policy work for medical issues, and advocacy, and so I was all over the place. I traveled everywhere in Pennsylvania, um, and really, uh, the second day I was there, we had this discussion about the opioid crisis, um, which the outgoing administration had kind of mentioned, but not that much, actually. And so it became uh, really my signature issue, and again, that intersection between medical issues and, and behavioral health and, and, and uh, mental health issues, which fit my skill set. And um, I was able to go out and do a lot of advocacy, work a lot on policy. Uh, one of the things I did at the very beginning, which I'm very proud of, is I was the first state health official to, uh, to have a standing order for naloxone. So uh, I, I said, you know, we want to expand naloxone. Why don't I write a prescription for the state that everybody can get naloxone based upon my prescription? Uh, that had to be vetted by 475 attorneys, literally, um, uh, that we could do that. But um, so I wrote a it was the first state health official to write a prescription for the state for naloxone, for first responders and for the public, so that anyone could go to a pharmacy and get naloxone, mm -hmm. um, uh, Narcan, to reverse overdoses based upon my prescription. So that's actually one of the first things we did as, uh, as physician general. What other things did you identify in that first year that you needed to identify? To work on. Um, so we worked on, on, um, on opioids. Um, I was the chair of the board of the Patient Safety Authority, so um, hospital safety was a big issue. Um, I did um, work a lot with the Epi Bureau and the Lab Bureau on uh, outbreaks and things like that. And then I worked um, a lot on advocacy for the LGBT community. So um, we, we started a policy group. Um, a policy work group with all the different agencies, and I chaired that group um, uh, under the governor's leadership. And we worked on lots of different LGBT issues, and I spoke, uh, um, did a lot of that around the state as well. Now, at some point, you became also, as well, the Secretary of That's Health. That's correct. Ta what yeah. what so, was that transition? Um, so like? that happened um, after about two years. Uh, the, the Secretary, um, Karen Murphy, left uh, state government, which is pretty common. Um, they don't call it public service for nothing in, in terms of, of our salaries. And, uh, and so she went to Geisinger um, uh, Health System uh, to be their uh, head of um, public health, inno uh, health innovation. And so I was named in July of 2017, I was named as, as Secretary of Health. So at that time, I was acting secretary and physician general. And then when I was confirmed, um, I became the Secretary of Health. That's a different job. So it's, um, it, it's more managerial and administrative, 
Uh, we have a staff of around 1,500 people. Uh, we have a budget of over a billion dollars, federal, state money. Um, and you, know, you, 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 do, you, set, you do the budget, you set the priorities for the, the Department of Health, you work with the governor's office, you work with the legislature. Um, and so it's, it's a much bigger job, uh, more mm -hmm. challenging. Um, mm -hmm. I like um, challenges. I like a steep learning curve. I find that challenging and stimulating. And so um, we, um, I worked as Secretary of Health for the last two years. Does that give you more visibility as well? In terms of certain um, I ended up with issues. a fair amount of visibility as, as physician general, but yes, there's even more visibility as Secretary of Health, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the priorities that we have had, again, opioid crisis. So the governor actually declared it had a disaster declaration in, in, uh, a year ago, and so we have a command center structure at the Emergency Management Association, and, and uh, health is lead on that. And uh, we have done work on prevention, on rescue with naloxone, on expanding access to treatment with medication assisted treatment and worked with our other states and federal and the federal federal government on, on that um, I am the regulator of medical marijuana so I never knew when I went to medical school and residency program that I would be the regulator of medical marijuana uh, I have to tell you I've gone 180 degrees um, I can see the skepticism in your faces um, I was very skeptical when I started but as I've learned more about it and and talked with lots of physicians and patients uh, I think I think that it's an excellent program I think that you have to do it right. I think that we have threaded that needle to keep it a very medical program. Mm -hmm. They are starting to talk about recreational in New York and New Jersey and in Pennsylvania as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I've, I've taken great pains to say that um, that, I, that that should not be in the Department of Health. I do not want to run recreational. Um, I've tried to, to distinguish the medical program from whatever they're talking about with recreational um, and have argued, um, uh, and I think I'll take the kudos, so that we have to protect you. That, we, that it should be 21 years of age, and we have to protect youth from um, exposure to recreational marijuana if they go down that route. But it's not, not really clear yet. But the medical program, I think, has been um, is excellent and is really helping people. We have um, over 100,000 patients who've registered for the program. We have uh, well over 1,000 physicians uh, who are certified to do the program. We have 21 serious conditions for which it's indicated, including primarily for, for our for pediatric patients, the kids with intractable seizures, with Lennox Gastaut and Dravet syndrome and, and others, but um, other youth, uh, perhaps kids with cancer and severe nausea from chemotherapy, um, uh, maybe a couple other indications. It's primarily an, an adult program. Um, a nursing home regulation. Uh, we ha uh, the nursing home industry has changed tremendously uh, from it used to be more of uh, not for profit or small for profit, um, um, small uh, for profit uh, companies. It is now national conglomerates where they're owned by people in primarily New York and New Jersey, sorry about that, and they own you know, 50 nursing homes in seven different states, but there's no accountability to care in those nursing homes, and so we have a lot of trouble in terms of safety and quality of care in nursing homes, so that's under my province. Um, uh, public health preparedness. If you wanna know what keeps me up at night, it's the risk of pandemic flu, 1918 flu, or what the CDC calls disease X. You know, uh, uh, a couple weeks ago we had a uh, a patient who came from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where they have the current Ebola outbreak, uh, and then made his way to, Penn, to Philadelphia and collapsed and was brought to Penn. And we were gearing up for our Ebola drill about what we were going to do. And I was on, essentially on my way to Philly when we learned that he had something else, that it wasn't Ebola. But uh, that's, that would be serious or whatever illness is a plane ride away from Philadelphia. Um, so those are the type of things that I think about every day, as well as, as I mentioned, uh, the loss of our Title X programs. So one of the biggest threats in terms of adolescent health is going to be the changes. There's a great article in Health Affairs from about two days ago um, uh, about the, the uh, outlines very, care, very uh, well the, the, the changes in the Title X program under this administration. It's going to be devastating for many of the Title X programs that our staff work in. Wow. So you mentioned confirmation process. I have to say, I don't know any of us have ever been through a confirmation process. Um, it's fun. Could you tell us a sure. little bit more so about what's involved? So when I became physician involved. general, they realized that, ooh, I had to be confirmed. They didn't quite get that. And so everyone realized that the openly transgender physician general will now have to be confirmed by the overwhelmingly conservative Republican state senate. And so there was some angst about, about that. So I went to um, meet all the 50 senators, and it was, it was great for me and a tremendous learning experience because I had not 
really known that much about how our state government runs, and each state is kind of different. Um, and it was a learning experience for them to welcome me into their chambers and shake my hand for a lot of them. Actually, they hadn't met too many transgender individuals. And so we spoke primarily about public health. Um, I can tell the story, I won't use his name um, uh, because he's not in the, in the Senate anymore, but uh, one of the senators said, you know, you're, you're obviously qualified, but as far as I'm concerned, you're an agent of the homosexual agenda. And I went, my first thought was, you know that song, Secret Agent from the 60s? It's like, cool, I'm a secret agent, um, but I didn't say that. If I had said that, it probably would have been bad. Um, and, and my second thought was, Senator, that's actually transsexual, not homosexual. Different. But I didn't say that either. I just said, you know, no, sir, I'm just really here to do public health. Uh, but um, most of the senators, if not overwhelmingly pleased, were cordial. There were a few that were less cordial. But one of the things that I'm very proud of is I was unanimously confirmed by the Republican State Senate um, as physician general. And then as secretary, I was confirmed 49 to 1. And guess who the one was? Um, uh, same person. Um, uh, so, but now I'm going through the confirmation process once again. So, but he's not there, so I, I, it, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. But uh, it, it was interesting. I also, the press kept talking about the, tran the transgender or transsexual physician general. So, you know, I kept wondering, if I'm the transgender physician general, who's the cisgender physician general, you know? I mean, that person doesn't come to work. And so it was really nice when, when the press stopped saying that. They kept saying transgender, I mean, if I'm advocating about the, for the LGBT community, which I have done, I've um, gone out and talked like when the president did his, his uh, ban, when Health and Human Services have mm -hmm. done some of their rules, and I've gone out and very publicly spoken about things, then I think that that's fair. But if I'm talking about opioids or I'm talking about nursing homes, why am I the transgender secretary of health? So they've really mm -hmm. kind of gotten past that for the most part, which I thought was good too. But it did cause more of a stir in the press than I expected. And, um, uh, it, it's uh, it's different, you know, when you go to the grocery store and people, everybody, everybody knows, who, knows who you are, and you know, most people are pleased, not everybody. Uh, I just got some wonderful emails from people. I went out um, uh, right before I came and was uh, and confronted um, Senator Rand Paul, who, if you know, a couple days ago said that eh, those immunizations they cause a lot of side effects, and uh, so we, I went out very vocally against that. So I've gotten some less than happy emails from uh, the anti-vaccine community. That goes with the turf. So that gives a, me a little segue into your personal journey as a trans person. And what do you I wonder oh, okay. if you could tell it, if you sure. could share, if you could share sure. a little bit about yeah. that personal journey. So, you know, I mean, I mean, you all have seen me through this entire journey because you all knew Richard. And so it, um, uh, and it, it, it's been, it's been again, I mean, just an amazing journey and it's been so interesting and, and seeing life from, from both sides. So um, I always knew that I, it was different. I mean, my first memory, my first memory when I was about five or six years of age and I was a five by five, I was a precocious reader and there was a Superboy comic strip, you can go find it on the internet, where Superboy meets a, a, a female alien who he's kind of snarky to. And, and this alien turns Superboy into Supergirl and Clark Kent is now Clara Kent. And I remember reading that going, that's what I want. But how would you articulate it in 1962 or so? Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then in the 60s and the 70s, when, uh, during adolescence, right? I mean, if you, go into any, if you see trans patients or whatever, you know, puberty and adolescence, you know? Puberty is so much fun. You remember puberty? Uh, what if you're going through the wrong puberty? What if it's completely different than the way you visualize yourself? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really challenging. That was 1972. What, who were you going to tell? What would you say? There was no language for that. And so I compartmentalized it. I've always been very good at compartmentalizing it. And I put it there. And I worked really hard at school. Of course, I went to the Belmont Hill School. Anybody from Massachusetts? Belmont Hill, but Belmont Hill School is a very excellent all-male prep school. So I went to an all-male prep school. And I played football. And I played hockey. And I fit in. I, I fit in and uh, but had compartmentalized all those feelings. And then I went to college, and I went to, I said, oh, I'm at Harvard. I can go to the library. Now I can learn what, what this is. And uh, that was less than successful because there were dusty psychological textbooks telling me how, how, how essentially criminally insane I was. So that was good. Um, and then I went to Tulane Medical School. Um, anybody from New Orleans? Right? It's Tulane in New Orleans. It's not Tulane, it's Tulane. And, um, I again compartmentalized it and uh, met uh, Martha, many of you know Martha, and 
fell in love and got married and again, and my residency and et cetera, et cetera, until I turned about 40. So really, what you have to, I have to say is that for many of you in the room, for many of, many of the men, I did this for you, right? Because you can go to your partners and say, don't complain about my midlife crisis, look at me. I mean, <laughs> boy, all I want is a car. <laughs> Or a boat, or whatever you want. I don't know. Um, so, um, so I, um, you know, I, in my 40s, uh, whether it's midlife or whatever it is, I started to see a therapist, and I, you know, I, I talked about it, and I talked about it. And the, one of the therapists, I, I saw a whole bunch of therapists, and said something really interesting. He said, "Well, if I could do some psychological technique, which I know didn't exist, it was a thought experiment, and make it all go away, would you do it? You want to make it all go away?" And I went home and thought about that, and I came back and I said, you know, I would have sworn that I would have said yes. But no, it's part of who I am. And he said, well, let's explore it. Now, who knew how far the rabbit hole went, you know, in exploring it? It's kind of like the matrix, the blue pill and the red pill. Sometimes you wonder if you took the wrong pill, because it really went down the, it went down the rabbit hole to the matrix. But, um, but it's been quite a journey. It's been quite a journey. So I remember at, at, at Penn State Hershey, um, they, they were really great you know, um, at, at Penn State when I transitioned, and all of you were great. Um, there, there was, you know, your transition is very awkward because when you transition to the other gender, whether it's F to M or M to F, I mean, pe pe you're socialized into that gender from, from your childhood and adolescence, but we're not. And so it, it, you, 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 when, you, when you actually cross whatever that line is, you know, my hair was longer, and I used to say, well, I'm a hippie, you know, and I kind of am, but that wasn't when my hair was long. And, um, and so, but so you, there's these awkward times, you know, for, for, for especially for, for adults who transition because, you know, how to dress, how to act, you have to learn that on the, kind of on the go. So it's awkward. So thank you for putting up with my awkward, awkward moments. Um, uh, but Penn State was great, although I did talk with one of the administrators. And um, actually, he's not there. He's, he used to be there. He's not there now. And he said, well, um, Rich, Rach, whatever, whatever you're going to call yourself. Um, Let's see, let's look at, you, you, your clinic is doing well, and uh, you're in the black on your budget, and you fulfill all your missions, you do administration, and you're doing, um, you're doing teaching, and um, you do research. In fact, you know, I, I actually won an award for the most, our, our division won an award for the most research with no money, you know, <laughs> with no funding, just research. Um, no grants, just, we, and he said, you know, I don't really care what you do, you're fine. And I was like, what if I was in the red? I mean, if I'm in the red, I can't transition? How does that go? <laughs> you know, you, you didn't fulfill your RVUs. Nope. <laughs> Try again next year. We'll see if you can transition. <laughs> but that's what that, you know, an administrator's point of view. So, um, so I transitioned at Penn State Hershey, and then, you know, and that was going well. And then, you know, uh, the, this, uh, this position, this right turn in my career fell from the sky. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, um, I, I like, it, it's been a, a, an amazing journey, an amazing career. I don't know how much time we have. We have, we have, got, time. Yeah, we we have, have tons of time. We have plenty of time. So, um, you know, I, and I think I expressed this to some of, you, some of you. I mean, I felt so gratified by my previous career and what everyone here does, right? All you do is help people. Right? You see patients and their families, and to the best of our ability and the best of your ability, you help people. You teach students and residents and undergrads about, how, about your field and how to do that better. You do research about how to help people and different ways to do that, clinical research and other research. And then you do administration and develop programs to help people. How, what's a better career than that, right? I mean, we're not, out, we're not, we're not making widgets. We're not, we're not making guns. We're not making bombs. We're not just out for the bottom line. You know, I think we all realize that if you if you, if, you, if you wanted the money, you, you went to the wrong field, right? I mean, you should have gone to business school. And so, um, as many of my, as, as my um, fellow classmates at Harvard did. So, um, this was an opportunity to make a difference and to help people from a, with a broader brush, from a public health perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, I feel really good about that. I mean, I think pretty much that's what, we, that's what I've tried to do. So, I feel gratified. So, you've got a very, very busy busy life with work. I'm wondering if you can share with us how you, how you feel a balance between your work 
and personal life have been, how, you, how you've done that or yeah. what choices yeah. you've made? So my first response is, physician, heal thyself. Um, I, I'm not sure I've been the, the best in terms of, of, of balance. Um, uh, there are times I had hobbies, um, uh, but I don't really have, not, not recently. Um, so I did, I did theater. Um, you, you, I, I try to use humor. I don't know if you noticed that, um, but I, I, I try to use humor. Um, I, you know, my, 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 my role model is Mrs. Maisel. Um, and, and so I, um, I used to perform. So in, in high school and in college, I did theater. And then for a while, in, in around the, in the, really the a decade of the, of the 2000, 2010, I did a lot of community theater. Um, so um, in fact, I was in The Sound of Music. You know who I was in The Sound of Music? I was Captain Von Trapp in The Sound of Music. I want to be the only person that does Captain Von Trapp and then 10 years later does, does Maria. You know, I, 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 I could do both. I could do both. Um, so uh, I, I, I have a quite nice voice. It's, it's kind of a baritone, so that's a little bit hard, but I have this baritone voice. So I, um, I love theater. I love performing. That's actually perfect for this position because a lot of times when I'm talking mm -hmm. to the press or even the Senate and you know, stuff, it's, it's uh, the House, yes. it's kind of performing. Um, but other than that, I, I can't tell you I have lots, tons of hobbies. Um, you know, I, um, uh, I, I was always there for my family uh, and my kids. And so I, that, that's, you know, the most important thing ever, you know, your children. And so, you know, I was, I was not a, a distant parent in any way. I was, I've been involved in every, everything, uh, the, the entire, you know, from birth to whatever. And so um, I, uh, that, that's the most gratifying thing. Um, I, I'm very close to, to, to my, my, my father passed about 11 years ago. He's the Patriots fan. Uh, and so my mother um, moved, then moved to, to uh, the Hershey area. Um, and she was an independent living. Now she's in kind of assisted personal care home living. Um, but I, I, you know, I, 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 for any of you who have elderly parents, that's, that's another, another resp significant responsibility. Um, uh, uh, I, my partner, uh, Louise, lives in uh, Sarasota, Florida. Uh, so we have this six-year long-distance relationship, which is challenging in its own right. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of hobbies. So, you know, pretty much I work. Um, and on um, um, the weekends, you know, unless Louise is there, I'm, I'm kind of seeing my mother and kind of hang out. I mean, the kids are home, and that's a different thing. But I can't tell you that I'm, like, I, I go for a walk. To, I go to go for a walk when the weather's not 10 degrees and snowing. <laughs> but, you know, with my dog. But not the best in terms of hobbies. Got to work on that. Have you thought about the next, the next Everybody's phase? been asking me about the, what's the next step. Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, uh, this is the beginning of the second term. So mm -hmm. clearly for four years, I'm, I'm set. But, um, so I'm not too worried about it right now. Uh, talk to me in a couple of years. I'll, I'm sure I'll be thinking about it. Um, I, I don't know. Um, you can't go back, you know? Um, so I, I, what would be going forward? And uh, I don't know what that would be. Um, uh, you know, does Washington beckon? Um, not in this administration, sorry. <laughs> uh, somehow I don't think I'm going to be asked. I don't know why, but, um, but I, 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 and I wouldn't serve. So, um, uh, but, you know, things change. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but other than that, I, I guess I have a, a certain confidence or faith, if you want to call it, that, that something's going to, there, there will be opportunities and something will come. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. And there's not, there's not a third term with this? No, term. no, I would not do this for a third term. I mean, <laughs> eight you. years, I mean, the average, not life expectancy, but the average <laughs> length of time that you're a Secretary of Health is about, uh, actually about three years. So I'm already, I mean, I wasn't Secretary for two years, so however you want to do it. But, you know, second term, I'm, I'm double the usual. So um, it, it is a... Um, it's a somewhat stressful job. Um, there's a lot of different things to balance. Um, public health is most important um, than all the stakeholders, and then you run this large agency, uh, and then you report to the governor, and then there's the politics. What I have to say is, the best training I have for the politics is adolescent medicine. <laughs> because when I'm dealing with, from a political aspect with the legislature and all the politics, everything comes down to adolescent medicine. Just telling you, you know. So you think people get past middle school, but they don't. It's the same thing. Um, and so when I'm talking with a lot of things from people from a political point of view, my my uh, my training in adolescent medicine mm -hmm. comes is very mm -hmm. valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so I would no, I'm not looking for a third term as that. Okay. Maybe politics. Maybe I should run for something. Oh, okay. That would be fun. It's a very Republican state. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Not always. Not always. <laughs> Governor Wolf's a very progressive Democrat. So I don't know if I don't know if a state is ready for a transgender political official. I don't know. Uh, there was a openly transgender woman that ran for governor in Vermont, um, but she lost. So we'll see. So I'd like to open um, the discussion. Thank you so much sure. for what you shared with us. Uh, and I'd like to open this up for discussion for people who have yeah, questions and... Um, I'm shy, but I'm getting past it. <laughs> Someone must have a question. Or it's going to be really boring. Hi, Hi thanks for sharing your sure. story. Um, I always like to ask patients after they've <laughs> been settled in whatever thing they're doing now, what would they have told their younger selves? Um, and yeah. Um, so, uh, we just had a conversation about someone that I knew at Mount Sinai who just passed away. Um, someone that had been a mentor when I was a resident there, Dr. Ramon Murphy, uh, has just passed away. And so I think what I would tell my younger self, and I tell myself, is, is just concentrate on what's important, right? Um, and don't sweat the small stuff. I think I do a pretty good job at that, actually. Um, uh, for a long time, I have meditated. Uh, I probably don't meditate as much now as I, as I used to, but I have found it very valuable mindfulness. Um, but I think that um, it is to, to pay attention uh, because, it's, because it's fleeting. Every, life is fleeting. And to uh, pay attention and care about um, your family, most of all, but then um, helping people. As I said, you know, I mean, to put out positive karma, to put out, you know, goodness to the world, uh, to, to work for the common good. And uh, why, else, why else are we here? Why else, what else would you work for? And so, um, you know, uh, money is, is very important. Um, it's obviously not the most important thing, or we wouldn't be where we are, and I wouldn't be doing this. But it, um, um, so I've never found, you know, a career where that's what the goal was, to be what I wanted to spend my time doing. And so I think to pay attention to, to cherish your family, cherish the moments, cherish your friends, all here, and um, and um, pay attention to the current, to the present moment. So to con continually remind myself that uh, through good times and bad times. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Anything about the transitioning process itself? Because sometimes young people, when they're yeah. in the thick of it. Um, you want to offer comfort, yeah. and um, I'm thinking your uh, pearl of wisdom would able us to do um, that better. So when I used to tell patients, and when I see when I um, see lots of of, of uh, citizens of Pennsylvania and everywhere, is is I mean I, I understand exactly what they're going through, um, and I mean I really do understand exactly what they're going through. Um, that uh, um, what I've often said in many uh, venues is that. For men, most people in the world, about 99.7% of the people in the world, maybe 99.5%, you know, you might question many things in your life. You might question your family. You might question your school. You might question your profession. Um, you might question your professional organization, not Sam, but other professional organizations. Um, but you don't question your gender. It's a fixed star in your universe. And not for me. And not for the trans patients that you see or individuals or gender non-conforming individuals, it's, it's always seen wrong or different and, 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 a, and, a, and a dilemma. Uh, for, for much of my life, um, gender was a splinter in my brain. I always would thought about gender. Now, I've been a very good compartmentalizer. I was always able to kind of put it there, but it was always there that this is not quite right, you know? The, um, and that, and it was always there um, until I transitioned, and it's not there. Um, which actually has been rather freeing in terms of thinking, of being able to appreciate the present moment and think about other things. Because again, even though I put it there, it was always there, rubbing and irritating me. And it's not. So uh, what a relief, you know? I mean, what a relief. The other was that there's nothing worse than having a secret. That, you know, and so I had this secret almost my entire life from almost everybody. And you know, you had the feeling that, well, you, you, know, you, you, know, you know, even for my family, you love me, but you wouldn't really love me. And you know, you're my friend, but you wouldn't really be my friend if you really knew. 
and, um, and uh, you know, my family is my family, and my friends are my friends, and I, my mother couldn't have put it better uh, when I was, when I, I think she was 85, so it was about maybe 10 years ago, that uh, she said, well, you know, honey, I really don't understand, but I, I kind of guessed something was up, because your hair is really long, and you wear makeup and nail polish now. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but um, you know, I, I, but you're my child, and I love you, so, okay. And so, what could be, I mean, what could be mm -hmm. more important than that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank Rich? you so much, Rachel. I just, you know, because I'm, I'm really a stickler for language. And the issue of splinter, mm -hmm. it was such, because, you know, you think of splinter, oh, it's something you put off to the side of the splinter group. But a splinter is also that annoying little thing that's under your skin, that you're doing something, and it gets on your index finger, and there's this thing that's in there, and you know it's wood, and how do you get it out? And that, and that word just is so, it helps me understand where you were. Thank you. Splinter. Yeah, that's how it felt. Splinter out of your fingernail, yeah. Except it was here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I, I, so, again, I, I, we all have strengths and weaknesses. I, I do have the ability to compartmentalize, you know. Sure. So, but not everybody does. And so think of, of people you know or your patients. Not everybody can put it there for, the, for years and still have a family or still go to medical school, you know, or college, or, and, and to be able to function. So I, 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 that's a gift to be, able to, to be able to do that and to be able to have continued to function, but not everybody can compartmentalize so well. And so, and at some point it becomes overwhelming. And the part, when I, be, to me, when it was overwhelming was uh, when it was starting in my, in my early 40s. Now, whether, that's, whether that was our culture, because we started to hear more about it, uh, or, and there was a, um, a trans support group uh, in central Pennsylvania that I, when I went to, or whether it was being 40, you know, and whatever that is, I, I don't know, but that's when it was, I could, I was starting to not be able to compartmentalize it. And that's when I had to try to express it. And then, you know, my transition was very different because for many reasons, professional and mostly personal reasons, I transitioned over 10 years, okay? Most people don't take that long to transition. First of all, young people are not willing to do that anymore. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if I was, 50, if I was 15 now, I don't know if I would have taken so long, but, but again, when I was 15, what were you going to say and who would you tell and how would you possibly express that? But, um, so the, the language started about, you know, and that was now 20 years ago, um, when I started, when I kind of started this journey. And it was starting to become more in culture and the internet and support groups, et cetera. So, um, uh, so I took a long time. Um, I don't regret uh, any of that. And so another thing I would tell is I have no regrets. I have no regrets. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. So one of the things that I learned when I transitioned is that, you know what, you can, you can change your gender. It's not as easy as you think to change your gender. It's a little challenging, but you can do that. What, what, what I can't be is 25 again. Okay, so you have this, in, think of this internal picture of yourself, and for mo many of us, it's, I don't know, maybe 30. I mean, it's 25, 30, something like that. Well, there's nothing I can do to be 25 or 30, to be a young woman, you know? So I'm, a, I'm an old lady. Um, and, and so uh, that's just what it is. I mean, that's why if you, if you see adults who transition, sometimes, um, especially male to female, they, they, they dress inappropriately because they have this internal picture of themselves at 25, except they're 55 and ooh. So that doesn't always look so good. Um, so, uh, but you have to kind of go through that awkward, that, that awkward phase. And I would tell when the adults I would see that, that was just challenging is that, you know, I can make you, I, I can, we can work on changing your gender, but I can't make you 25. So you're gonna have to kind of deal with that. But I have no regrets because if I transitioned when I was young and I wouldn't have my children. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a life without my children. And so every experience led me to here. And, um, uh, and so how could I regret that? And in this position as Secretary of Health, I use everything I ever learned. I channel everything. I channel what I learned as Chief Resident at Mount Sinai Hospital in 1986. I mean, I channel everything I've ever learned about leadership, about management, about administration, about budgets. You know, when I became, when, when we, I, uh, we started as the division in the eating disorder program, and I learned about budgets and administration and hospital administration. Um, I, um, despite what you might think, 
uh, there is a certain bureaucracy associated with state government. <laughs> in, in the case, can you believe it? Well, uh, I, I think you've probably learned now there's a certain bureaucracy associated with Penn State Hershey, right? <laughs> so, you know, and, and things take time and you have to kind of be fight and be persistent and but patient. And I learned all that. So everything, I channel all of that into my current profession and just being who I am. I really would urge you to consider writing down Thanks. an amazing story. And you already have the title. Splinter in my brain. Splinter in my brain. That Yeah, yeah, we have the transcript. Um, so I, I have thought of that. Um, be honest with you, um, for me to sit down and actually write it all out would be very challenging. I'm much better at at this. Um, so uh, what I would I would need to figure out a way to do that, meaning to to channel um, this type of conversation into chapters in a book, as opposed to actually sitting down with me, it would probably, because I'm a lousy typer, it literally would be, probably be a pen. Um, or I guess I could do dragon speak, you know, and, and just kind of talk into the computer. But, um, but I, I like the, the interaction, so maybe a series of talks, I don't know, something. Uh, I have thought about that. Um, uh, I can't really do that now. Um, I can't publish a book and, and make money from it, um, uh, the, uh, being a public official. So um, maybe at the end, maybe that's what I'll do at the end of all this. Maybe that's what I'll do. Yeah. Yeah, hi, thanks for a um, great conversation. Um, I was just curious, I never really considered this and the feelings, and then spoke about it that um, you're transition, you're happy without, you don't have any regrets. No regrets. But the way you spoke about, um, I'm not a 25 year old woman, do you experience a sense of loss? Did you go through a mourning of that, that you weren't a 25 year old woman? Um. I compartmentalize that. I mean, I mean, a little, you know, because I mean, I, I was never socialized as a, as a woman, um, and I never got to be a girl, right? So I never got to be a girl. But it's important for us to know that. Yeah. Since we're working with young people. So, um, I, and so, uh, yes, there is a little bit of warning about that, but I, I don't think that that's, that it's not, it's not useful for me to, 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 to dwell on that because. Again, how could I regret anything where my life led to where I am now? And, and, and most importantly is my children. So I can't em envision another life where I don't have my children. So everything happened for a reason. I don't know if that's true or not, but, uh, but here I am. So, uh, but yes, I think, that, I think you'll find that, that particularly adults who transition have, have a little bit of a sense of mourning of, of the, the boy or the girl that they never were, in either adolescence mm -hmm. or you know, maybe young adulthood, a yeah, young woman. Yeah. I have another second part. Of my yeah, question. sure. I was really struck when you talked about when you went through puberty, um, how you went through the withdrawing puberty. Yeah. So was it, and you didn't have language to describe it, but you understood that there was something different. So was, did you, I mean, I don't know if you can even say it, but was it a heightened experience then? Were you very thinking yes. about it? Well, that's when it crystallized. So before, I would have a thought and, and when I was a child. But as an adolescent, yes, it was much stronger. And there was no real way. I mean, the, the only person I could find uh, to read about was Christine Jorgensen. Um, and then, then um, Renee Richards was in the 70s. But I mean, Rene Richards was ostracized. I mean, it wasn't, it, it didn't like, oh boy, that'd be fun. I mean, it, it, and so, it, it, but it, it just seemed, so foreign. So I mean, again, there were a couple people. There was none of the the none of the um, positive or negative media that you have now, and so there was no way to process it. So I just mm -hmm. didn't understand it, mm -hmm. and um, I just I mean, I basically, I kind of said, well, this is something that's really weird about myself, and I can't understand it. So I'm going to put it here. But eventually, but you can't do that forever. But then I had this secret, and and having a secret from everyone you love and all your friends and all your family. It eats away at you, and so I don't, I don't think that, that that was healthy. I don't think it's healthy to do that. Um, so I think one of the thing, uh, a number of different things that was very positive when I came out and transitioned was the release of that secret. Right. So here I am. I mean, the, I only had one really big secret, and here I am. So there's nothing else. There's no other skeleton in the closet. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Did you continue to act throughout the whole period? And was it something that was helpful? So uh, a bunch of people have asked me that. So one, uh, the, the best one was, uh, so I, you know, I had a little talk, not an hour, but thank you for the time, but, but about a 10 minute talk at my, at my last college reunion. And so, you know, I came out and said, you know, well, you know, I'm Rachel Levine, and I'm, you know, at that time, you know, professor at Penn State and vice chair. And they were like, ah, you know, all of us are professors and vice chairs. And, uh, and I said, you knew me as Richard, and now I'm Rachel. And everyone went, ah. You know, and, and so, um, and afterwards, and, you know, I used some humor in that talk. And afterwards, a woman came up and said, you know, you were never funny as a guy. <laughs> 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 okay, um, I think that I am more animated now. Um, than I was before. I thought it was funny before, but I guess not, because <laughs> it wasn't funny. Um, but I think I am more, my, I am more Yourself. myself now. Um, um, mm -hmm. So, but I did channel it, channel into theater. I mean, so performing was not new, but I don't think that I let it out in my day. I think I was a little bit more tightly wound. Yeah. Um, but you know, my son asked me that. That was one of the questions when I told him, and he said, "Well, then, did all that stuff where we played football and we did this was that all an act?" And not, not at all. That was all, that was all me. I mean, it, it is hard for, pe for people, who, particularly family, because, the, you know, because they're, to me, I'm still who I am. And they're like, no, you're, you're different, though. You're different. And, and, and what, what for patients, you were mentioning patients, families grieve the loss of the, other, of the person you were. And my family has articulated that a lot, and other friends have articulated that, that they, mm -hmm. they, they, they miss Richard that they liked Richard and they missed Richard. Now, I'm, I mean, I'm still Richard, Rachel, you know? I mean, um, it's not like I talk to myself, Richard, what do you think? Rachel, I don't know, what do you, you know? Uh, um, and that's great, you know, that works really well if you agree, if you disagree, it's kind of a challenge. But I, but, um, uh, but they miss whatever that, whatever, however it is different. And so pa families particularly grieve that. Uh, friends can, can grieve that. I've been told, I've been mm -hmm. told that. To me, but it isn't like I miss, it's, it's still me. But, but other people notice that. But when I played football with my son, I was playing football with my son. And I was completely genuine and I enjoyed it completely. So I think that reassured him that it's not like I was doing it, I didn't like to do it, but I, mm -hmm. I kind of dragged myself to do it, that that was still me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, so at the beginning, um, until, so my last show, which was Rocky Horror, um, uh, was, was in probably, I don't know, 2010 or so. So not in the last um, almost eight, eight, eight or more years. Um, and uh, a lot of which is, was professional and, and personal, and I can't really do that now. So I act, I mean, Literally, if I'm in front of the camera talking about immunizations, it's a performance, right? I mean, it's, it, and, uh, it's still a performance. I'm just channeling the performance into my job, which is one, another reason why I really like my job. So, does that make sense? And we see quite a bit of you, actually. Yeah? You're on the nightly news. Really? Fairly regularly. Cool. <laughs> yes. um, so, I, I am, I am uh, 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 out uh, in many ways, uh, more than other cabinet members. Uh, and I think that that's, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that that's because I like to do it, where a lot of other cabinet members don't like to do that. I mean, they do it when they have to do it, but they don't really enjoy it. And I, so I have, uh, what I tell to our communications director is that I want I, I like public speaking, I like being in front of the camera, I like um, interviews and things like that. Let's use that for public health, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's use it to accomplish things. So I don't want to be out there just to do it, um, but um, we can use that, uh, that, um, Ability, you know, uh, uh, to uh, for the for the common good for public health. So we try to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, can you hear me? Your name goes like. Uh, I can hear you. Okay. Cool. Talk loud. Hi. Hi. I'm Claire. I'm an adolescent fellow at a private school hospital. I'll be calling you next week. Really excited. But um. Great. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, so, um, several different things. So, one is that, um, you know, for the most part, uh, I'm a positive and optimistic person, right? So, I'm, try I I'm, I'm trying to, to I, see, I really try, sometimes not successfully, but try to see the good in everyone. And so, you know, um, uh, we have worked with the, the legislature on many different things, particularly opioids, but many other things that we've accomplished. And so um, I compartmentalize um, any um, those concerns and try to uh, to greet them as they are, and to and to try to find common ground. And I, and I have been successful in terms of doing that. Um, I'm not a particularly angry person, um, and you know I don't I don't I don't particularly get angry. Um, I, I can get upset and I can get fussy and. You know, if I, if I haven't eaten and I'm tired, I'll be fussy. But I, I don't, it's not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly comfortable with anger, and I'm not a particularly angry person. So I, I absolutely don't get angry at them. Um, I can get kind of frustrated, um, and um, that's, this is part of this job. So if you're not going to do that, then you shouldn't take this, this job. But I didn't know any of that when I started. I mean, so it, it all, it, I mean, learned, it, it's been a steep learning curve. Um, so there's an absolute political perspective to this job, and it's very interesting because part of it is that as a state health official, I have to be completely nonpartisan, right? I mean, it's not like I'm out for the common good of Democrats, but not Republicans. I mean, so we, I'm out for the, for the, for the, for the, for the public health and, and common good of everyone. Um, and the second time, though, I'm an agent of the governor, and that's a political position. So it's a little bit of both, and it's, an interest, it's fascinating to balance that. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, hi, I just, uh, I'm Bill Edelman, uh, hi. Kenneth, Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I just want to let you know uh, a couple of things. Number one is um, thank you. Um, I want you to know that you are a rock star thank to you. me, uh, and that I've admired you and your career for a very long time. Uh, I first met you, uh, we went out to dinner a number of years ago at a Sam meeting, and at that point you had long hair and nail polish. Uh, that was sort of where you were. And way before I started taking care of any trans uh, gender patients. Um, and you really um, showed yourself as a model of, Thank in you. essence, really the first trans person I ever felt like I knew. Um, and it was after one uh, dinner. And it, it really made, made a, a remarkable impression on me. So I want, I want to let you know that just being who you are really made a big impression on me. Thank you. And really helped me many ways now that I take care of a, a number of transgender um, patients where I am. Uh, so, so thank you for everything that you've done and, and you really are a rock star to me and to my whole family. Um, with that said, I have a, a question for you. Sure. Medical marijuana in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that it's indicated for Crohn's disease uh, on the list of uh, Pennsylvania elements. And the reason why I bring it up is because my son has Crohn's Cognizant of the fact that it's um, it's permitted for uh, uh, it's a there's an indication yes. for that. Yeah. And so he's waiting to be 21 so he can get his uh, medical marijuana card. Um, and so I actually do have a, a, a an actual medical question, which is uh, sort of the reasoning behind Crohn's disease being on that sure. list, and then also any suggestions you might have. Sure. So um, Crohn's disease was added by the legislature. So the, with the original law. They had, uh, which I was not involved in. So at that time, I was physician general and not really involved with making laws or, or regulating, um, coming up with the regulations. Um, so they came up with 17 conditions. Um, the reason those 17 conditions are there, for the most part, are, are because of, of um, advocacy and lobbyists who came to lobby them about those 17 conditions. Um, some of whom, are, are, I think, are, are very good indications. Um, particularly, um, uh, you can tell because there's duplications. It says inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease. Um, it says uh, intractable seizures and epilepsy. I mean, so there's, there's, there was a lot of um, interesting duplication and, uh, and how they, add the, they, they did, uh, added those conditions. Um, uh, but the intractable seizures slash epilepsy, the kids with Lanes Castell and Gervais and others, I mean, that, that, those parents were the primary advocates. But then once the, it was obvious the legislature was going to be able to enact the law, um, other, other advocates came in, and, and that's how the 17 conditions were added. Uh, there are a number of conditions that um, there, are, there is some literature about 
um, about Crohn's disease and medical marijuana. Um, one thing that you might find really interesting is to take the CME. Uh, so if you go on the medical marijuana website for the Department of Health, there are six different CME courses. You can pick one. Um, uh, it's, it's category one, AMA, CME, and you don't have to be certified in the program to take the CME. Uh, and you can learn a lot, of, uh, there's a, some excellent literature, and it was one of the things that, that kind of turned me around, is there's more than literature than you think about the utility of medical marijuana. And there is some for Crohn's disease, not as much as I would like. Um, others, another condition for which I, I certainly wouldn't have added it would be autism. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, that, that's, that that's an issue. I think that the indications for medical marijuana for pediatric patients are pretty limited. And I think it's mostly the kids with seizures. Um, I think it's also uh, potentially, um, especially adolescents with cancer and chemotherapy and induced, and induced nausea. Potentially, one of the good indications, and what most patients are using medical marijuana for is chronic pain as an alternative to opioids. And I think that, you know, potentially some kids with chronic pain, adolescents with chronic pain might have some utility. Uh, otherwise, I think that the indications for kids are pretty limited. Um, I have added, um, the, the board recommended that we um, reserve medical marijuana the, the certifiers for physicians uh, for pediatric patients to be pediatric specialists. I haven't implemented that because we don't have enough pediatric specialists throughout the state. So I have to be careful of, of um, health equity. And so if you have a child with intractable seizures but you live in an area where you can't find a pediatric specialist, um, that's not fair. And so if I get enough pediatricians, then I will implement that, that part. Um, so uh, we're, we're adding new conditions extremely slowly and, and carefully, but the original 17 were, were part of the original, an original act in the legislature. In terms of advice, you know, I, I, I mean, I would look at the literature about the indications for, uh, for medical marijuana for Crohn's disease. It doesn't cure anything. Medical marijuana doesn't cure anything. It's for symptoms. And potentially for, for, for chronic GI symptoms, whether it's nausea, um, or other GI symptoms, pain. Uh, there might, I think there is some utility for medical marijuana for selected patients, but not for you. Yeah? We'll take this as a last, last question, because we're uh, running out of time. Can I ask one, before you do time. that, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your, the previous, before we got into technical needs, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I appreciate the shout out. Thank you, it means a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, I can tell. We can. I, I got a. I got a million of them. I got a million of them. Just call me Mrs. Nasal. Yeah. My question is really more policy related. Fine. Somebody else wants to ask more personal or just because we're out of time. Well, we'll take this as a last question because we're running out of time. I don't want to. Yeah, um, uh, hopefully, you know. Um, so um, I, I, I have stayed away from the recreational marijuana discussion at this point because I want to draw a clean line between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. Um, but if, if the legislature takes it up seriously, then I will be involved because I want to make sure you know, to have protections for public health, both from, uh, just like you said, from smoking, et cetera. Um, and the second is to protect youth. Um, but I do not want to be, I, I made it very clear, I do not want to be the regulator of recreational marijuana. You can, you can put it in the Liquor Control Board, or you can have its own board, or you can give it to the Department of Agriculture as a crop if you want, but, but don't put it in the Department of Health because I don't want anyone to feel that recreational marijuana is for your health. But it is different than the specific conditions for which medical marijuana is, is recommended. And I, 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 I really think that, that medical marijuana is, is beneficial. Um, I think that what the best thing to do is to, is to um, reschedule it to a schedule to, or to a different schedule by the DEA so that we can do research. And I don't have time to talk about it, but I, we, do have, we are going to be sponsoring a whole new research mm -hmm. program in Pennsylvania to be one of the leaders for medical marijuana research in the country. Well, I want to thank you all for being here, and I really want to thank, thank you, you, Rachel. I this has been so much. this has been wonderful Thanks. sharing your experiences. Thanks. Oh.